tell us how you really feel about the healthcare industry? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know, the, the truth is that it's it really is something we have to continue to address. The reforms of last year were significant, but we have to continue to move forward. People are still filing for bankruptcy because of healthcare bills, and no one can truly justify why it is that something should be charged at those exorbitant prices. And people that are in emergency situations have zero choice. So, th you know, I think a lot of what we said needed to be said. Uh, we are headed towards insolvency if we don't do something about our healthcare system. You mentioned yeah. scope of practice and uh, a couple of other things, but what else uh, is the, the House, uh, you know, can you give us some coming attractions about what is either in the budget or policy-wise to uh, rest? I, I imagine you're talking about Medicaid budget, uh, you know, the, Anything else? I know well, we're also on talking about the mechanisms, and so a lot of the barriers that allowed the empire building that went on with the hospital industrial complex are the things that now we have to fight back. CON was part of that, but there are barriers on things like telehealth that we removed last year. But right now in the state of Florida, a patient does not own their own medical records. Well, how can a patient do any real shopping around if they don't own their own medical records? But under what circumstance would we allow someone to pay for something and then not receive it? The things that we allow in healthcare, we just don't allow in any other part of our society. We allow gouging, we allow people to be put on gag orders in settlements, we allow people to not own their own medical records. It's real insanity. And so will and there be stuff to address some of that? Like there will be legislation. On well, we're not a fan of caps. What we're right. a fan of is allowing people to make choices and allowing the environment that has lowered the price of everything else in our society, except the two things that government has a big hand in, and that's healthcare and higher ed. Those two things continue to climb. I, I, I think it's. I think there's causation in that correlation. Mr. Schmidt, you mentioned a, a robust tax break this year. Last year, you guys, the House had a tax break that they didn't act on until 9 p.m. the last day of session. Wondering why you handle some tax breaks that way, and can you make any sort of assurance that whatever you guys do past this year will get adequate scrutiny? Well, I, I think. Look, I think it always gets adequate uh, scrutiny. That's how the process is. Why some things wait until the end and others don't depends on what types of other things are moving around and what effects. If there's legislation that has a fiscal policy and we're waiting to see if that legislation passes, we have to understand what effect that will have on the budget. And so oftentimes we have to wait. You know, the House always proposes a very strong, strong tax break. I can't guarantee that when all the dust has settled, we will get everything that we want. But we have to set out with a strong message about if we have excess income, it is not our job to find a way to spend it. If we can return that to the taxpayer, it's important that we do. We never know what the economy of tomorrow is going to be like. Can you guarantee that any policy that will be in the tax package will be reviewed by a House committee before you vote on it? I don't, I, I, the answer is yes. I don't know why, uh, why that would be in question, as anything that comes before this floor would have had to have passed the committee. I wonder how you feel about uh, the advanced nurse uh, practitioners uh, in your last session. How hard are you going to fight for them? Well, I, I think that we've, sh we've shown that we are going to put our full strength behind it. The bottom line is, is that it is incredibly wrong. There is no data that in any way supports that this is in any way dangerous and would not be tremendously effective. There is one organization that is standing in the way of this. We are an innovative state, but in this area, there are 30 states, red, blue, and purple, that have moved in this direction. It's truly a stain upon our state, and it's time to change it. Can I ask you a couple of things that we haven't heard too much from you on, but um, the teacher pay issue is a big, big ticket item, and the governor really wants it. And then also, what was ruled out yesterday out of the Senate on guns and you know expanding background checks and uh, you know some some limits on that. What, what, and also an expansion of um, of the red flag laws. What, what are your thoughts going on? Well, on the on the matter of teacher pay, I think as you saw as uh, as I made in my remarks, we've made a commitment to the governor that we will put forth a significant teacher pay increase. But it has to be sustainable and equitable. We can't simply go after some target and say we want to be number two in the nation. Again, two compared to what? Compared to a state whose cost of living is significantly higher than ours? We have to take the right approach to this so that it is something that we can sustain. If we get in a bad economy, it is something we can sustain. But the House is committed to supporting the governor on that priority. What about either? Uh, the governor has prioritized the issue. Uh, he, there's already two bills, one in the Senate, one in the House. Uh, the one in the House carves out some private employers from the mandate. 
is there a stance we've taken on the issue yet? Well, the, our position on that issue will be the same as our position on everything. It has to fall within the principle of less government and more individual freedom. Uh, I, I'm not in the position to tell individual business owners that they have to become our arms of the government. But I also understand the importance of making sure that there's not a proliferation of undocumented citizens if we can help it. So there's a balance there somewhere, and I, I think that uh, it'll, be a, it'll be a tough road because we have to make sure not to infringe upon private employers. Do you think can the current bill has that balance? I think that it's a good start. There's, much, there's more work to do. No one's mentioned Visit Florida yet. yet. No, today. no, they, they, they haven't just yet. And, and uh, you know, the truth is that it's, it's once again uh, going to be one of those issues of reality versus perception. Visit Florida is a case study in reality versus perception. They, there is, the, the evidence is overwhelming that the minuscule size of Visit Florida can in no way have an effect on an economy, the 20th largest economy in the world. But they have managed, and to their credit, their best feat of promotion has been to convince everyone in this chamber and in the other chamber that but for their efforts, we would be facing global isolation. Well, looking at uh, scholarships. Part B of my question on guns, your, your thoughts on uh, what the Senate we're, we're always very careful when we in any way start to infringe on those things that people consider their constitutional rights. I think that we made great strides. If you talk to the sheriffs around the state, they will tell you that our red flag laws that we passed before they were even named red flag laws after Parkland have already saved lives. These are the areas that we have to be looking to. There is no proof that a person's ability to get a weapon affects their, their ability to use it. And so we have to be very careful when we once again look to trample on people's constitutional rights. Looking at college. Department of Corrections, uh, you mentioned in a radio show recently that you would support uh, cr uh, increases, salary increases in the Department of Corrections. Could you expand on exactly what you would like to see? Now, well, we don't have an exact number, but what we do know is that the starting pay is too low. And so what ends up happening is that people that come to work for the correction center soon thereafter move on to something else. And, uh, and that, that high turnover creates a lower quality service. And so we're, we have to raise it to the point where people can at least feel that they can stay there for a sustained period of time and that they feel that there's some, uh, some level of sustainability in them choosing that as a career. I don't know what that number is. You mentioned scholarships out there for students. Uh, what kinds of potential changes could be out there for scholarship programs. Well, I think if you if you look at uh, the, uh, our our, uh, our like able scholarships that we use for private colleges, you know we don't necessarily look at what a person's income is when we give them these scholarships. I think it's important that we do. If there are people that are low income that could use a scholarship, why should the children of people like me be able to receive them? I think we have to take a look at that. Also, uh, Chair Fine has done great work in trying to figure out why it is that we send some people with low grade point averages directly to a university when they would be better served and we would financially be better served if they started out of college and then they moved their way up. I think that we have to, we have to look at the, the eligibility of, of these scholarships and we have to look at the outcomes of these scholarships. So you're thinking about means testing some of the scholarships that are, that are currently in place and that's kind of an idea that's floated in the past that, that's gotten some resistance, especially if you're talking about some of the futures. Yeah, I, I think that any time that you touch any scholarships or even begin to talk about them, the immediate, the immediate uh, backlash is that we are hurting uh, the opportunity for people to go to college. What we're talking about is making sure that these scholarships are being properly used so that it can be expanded to all of those people that truly need it. But in order to do that, we have to do a true invest, invest, investigatory look at who we're giving them to now. When are we going to see some bills on all the stuff that you're talking about? I know some of them are out there, but there's some, some pretty low numbered bill slots that haven't been filed yet. So. Yeah, you know, I, I think you're going to be seeing them this week and, and, the, and the coming week. You know, not, uh, as you can tell from last year, not all bills with a low number mean a specific thing. We've been very clear in the House about saying what matters to us and about saying what we're going to pursue. And so uh, bill numbers, I guess, in the, in the past have, have meant this is the first order, this is the first work that we're going to do. Uh, but in our case, we've been very clear about what it is we will do. On, going back to the, the tax uh, stuff, like unemployment's at like 3.3, 3.5. Is that something that's really necessary to have a real huge tax break to spur employment? Well, remember, it's not a tax break. 
It's monies that came into Excellent. the state that belong to the people of the state that we don't necessarily have to find a brand new use for. You know, we call it tax break, but it's really just giving you back your money. It's money that you gave to us. And if, and if we're judicious about how we spend that money, we won't go around. I'm, I'm truly concerned about having a flood of money. The economy's been great. Every time that we have too much money, we find a new way to spend that money. And then when an economic slowdown comes, we're put in a tough situation. Well, if we can guide the state, as we have, with fiscal restraint, as steady as we go, whenever those slowdowns come, our leaders will be able to deal with them and make them more shallow and recover quicker. So I think, if anything, we should use those dollars and put them towards reserves. So you're not worried more. about cutting too much too if a recession happens and then not having enough money to run? I mean, the state already has like people on waiting lists for uh, you know all sorts of... Vital well, and, and that's why, and that's why Chairman Cummings uh, has been part of a reprioritization program. We can't see, as I mentioned, you know, uh, spending isn't caring; solving is caring. If you say there is a need, whether it's the adults with disabilities waiting list, saying to someone, if you don't fund that with new money, you just don't care. Well, what about the last money that you gave me for me to handle that? What did I do with that? And it's important that we go back and find that every dollar is being spent properly before we ever ask anyone for a new dollar. And that's what we're doing. We're going back and finding out how have we spent these dollars and shouldn't be, they be in places like this. We have to ask ourselves, would we rather fund Visit Florida or would we rather dig into that waiting list on adults with disabilities? Can I ask you something on Do you support uh, repealing Best and Brightest and replacing it with the new bonus program the governor's proposing? We're very open to the idea of using those dollars. That goes back to reutilizing dollars. So we're very open to the idea of repurposing those dollars in some form of compensation package, but it's still early. But to be clear, you would be okay with repealing best of brightest? I would. Okay. Can I ask you a question? Can I ask you something? Yeah. Uh, the, the governor just outside a moment ago, he was talking about that teacher pay plan and, his, and an education poll that showed it was very popular, you know, his idea. And he was kind of using that as part of his argument. He still wants it his way. I'm wondering, you know, the governor's poll numbers have been pretty high as well. Well deserved. And I, and I wonder, when it comes to some of this... Uh, second year back and forth between the Republican leaders. Does the, does the governor have a little bit of an advantage going in here based on his standing among Floridians? Well, I think the governor always has an advantage. One, he has the largest bully pulpit. But two, in reality, he has the advantage that we're fans of his too. Uh, you know, we supported the governor early on. We've supported him in his initiatives. So yes, he, certainly he has an advantage that way and not, and not one that I'm reluctant to admit. But it is important, we have a responsibility too, and that's making sure that whatever we propose is equitable and it is sustainable. And that's the, and that's the path that we will pursue. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you.